Ladies and gentlemen, greetings from London, and thank you very much um, for joining us uh, for today's webinar. This is the first webinar that we organized within the context of the Kings of Japan program at King's College London. And I am particularly delighted today to welcome an old friend and a new friend. My name is Alessio Patlana, and I am the director of the King's Japan program of the Department of War Studies at King's College London. Welcome everyone. I'm joined today uh, by Professor Takako Hikutani, who is the Jerry Curtis Professor in Japanese uh, Modern Politics and Foreign Policy at Columbia University. And I'm very pleased also to be joined by uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Masashi Murano, who is the Japan Chair Fellow at the Hudson Institute. Um, from DC, uh, Murano-san and uh, Takako Kosiwani in New York at the moment. Thank you both uh, for joining me this afternoon. Before we start, allow me to make a couple of quick points. Uh, first of all, uh, we are recording live on Facebook, we're streaming on Facebook, so for those of you who weren't able to um, catch a, a ticket, uh, please do follow us there. Um, and we're also making a recording of um, uh, the webinar, uh, which will uh, then um, upload um, pending any technical problems once this is all finished. Um, Insofar as the dynamics of today's webinars are, are, are concerned, uh, we're going to do as follow. Um, I will make some brief introductory remarks on the regional security dynamics uh, before uh, giving the floor to Murano-san, who will more specifically focus on a perspective from Japan on the security dynamics in the region as they are evolving at the moment. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, passing the baton on to Professor um, Hikutani, who will sort of give us further insights as to um, insights how the politics in Japan are playing out around uh, the coronavirus and foreign policy and security agendas. And um, after the remarks, which will be kept to about 10, 15 minutes each, we will open the floor to questions and you can only use the chat um, to um, uh, 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 let us know what would you are like to ask to the panelists and I will operate as a sort of uh, chair um, in trying to organize and divide the questions uh, from uh, among the three of us. Without any further ado, uh, let me start with an apology um, and on, on my hand because yes, the, the seminar is titled Japan and East Asian Security, but if we're talking about regional landscape, I do prefer to use um, in the Pacific um, as the main framework of analysis for uh, um, the regional context. And, and that's because uh, the centrality that the maritime space has uh, to this region, um, and uh, in particular, um, how it reflects on the matter of, of connectivity. And um, the sea is the fabric that brings together this wider space. Um, and what I like about this idea of the Indo-Pacific, as Rory Metcalf um, quite nicely uh, points out in his latest book, um, is this idea that connectivity is about defining the center of the space, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Oceans, but leaving the uh, periphery um, of it, if you want, um, uh, study more nebulous, because it's an inclusive space. Maritime spaces are about connecting spaces that can be far apart, and that connection uh, if, may not always be used, but it's always there. Also, I think what is very important insofar as the discussion, uh, today's discussion is, 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 uh, is concerned, um, is how this idea of the Indo-Pacific speaks to two questions, uh, two issues, if you want, that in security terms are central to understand how, in the context of COVID and post-COVID, um, the security landscape is evolving. One is the idea of order, um, uh, as uh, not just a matter of material power, but a matter of legitimacy. And I'll talk a little bit more of what it is the meaning of power and legitimacy in the maritime-centric regional landscape. And uh, the second aspect is how connectivity also, or our understanding of connectivities, whether we use vocabulary that talks about globalization or interdependence, also are changing. Um, and are likely to change, or at least there is an important question as we move forward. So let's start with the first one, with the first point, the one that concerns the question of a connectivity, because it is very central to the sense of identity of the Indo-Pacific, as it is. 
Um, it is quite interesting that uh, whilst COVID has highlighted how quickly world trade could shrunk uh, due to the inability to operate ports and operate factories, production lines, and so on and so forth, um, Costco um, shipping actually started um, in April in the middle of a situation where international trade and global shipping was down in very significant fashion, a point that we'll return upon in a minute. It started a new, Costco started a new uh, 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 East Mediterranean um, east uh, coast of the United States connection routes. One route that will link Italy, Spain, Turkey, Egypt, uh, Greece, Israel to the east coast of the United States. Um, which raises an interesting sort of, or puts a, a spot, a highlight on a particular component of how important China has become in the context of international shipping and how in many ways the Indo-Pacific connectivity rests um, on uh, trade routes that are operated today um, in a significant proportion by Chinese company. Of course, could be certainly the most significant actor. Um, just to give you a couple of numbers, we're talking about um, 401 shipping routes operated in 2019 by Costco, of which 255 are uh, provide international services of sorts. If this is an interesting story, in the middle of a crisis that saw global shipping and connectivity being significantly reduced, Costco started operating a new uh, a trade route. Um, we've seen, on the other hand, um, some significant contractions and also, um, if you want, the contractions with a significant implication in terms of how visions of the Indo-Pacific are coming together. Most notably, um, the significant reduction during the periods of January to the end of February, beginning of March, um, in terms of uh, um, a, a Chinese industrial output, uh, key projects in the sort of periphery of uh, 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 the Indo-Pacific would be part of the Belt and Road Initiative as the Chinese vision uh, for the similar place, the similar regional states um, has it, um, has seen considerable impact. Places like the Middle East, where the majority of the investment projects are run by Chinese company on Chinese imported products and Chinese worker, um, have seen a significant sort of delays and contraction in their ability to uh, sort of operate. And it is very unlikely that in the foreseeable future, we'll see a return to a degree of normality, provided that there are no guarantee that the spread of COVID is entirely under control. Um, what is interesting is to highlight how the sort of like the contrast between what I was mentioning earlier on, Costco launching a new trade route as opposed to the general contraction. On the 24th of April, just a couple of weeks ago, um, a consortium of some of the most important uh, uh, port operators led by Singapore signed a declaration um, in, in, that emphasized their commitment to keep shipping open, notwithstanding the fact that an enormous amount of cargo shipping at the moment is uh, sitting around almost a half empty. Um, and that's a, a powerful reminder of the fact that uh, things like food, um, energy requirements, medicine, about 80% of all of it um, that sort of goes around the world uh, travels at sea at any point um, in time. The combination of the tension between the uh, continuous trend and certainly the cost of starting of operating a new trade route speaks to uh, this continuous sort of upward trajectory of global trade expansion um, as opposed to the short term a significant contraction um, that we've seen under COVID has exposed a bigger problem that is intrinsic to the question of connectivity. And that sees China at the center of it. That is the question of supply chains. One of the things that has been highlighted during the COVID crisis is how um, uh, the reduction of global trade has affected in particular Europe, the United States, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam in that order when it comes to dependency on uh, China. It must be said that Chinese sort of um, exports um, are constitute about 20% of global trade in terms of manufacturing intermediate products. Um, and that's a figure that has gone up since, two, if you compare it to 2002, when it constituted only 4%, it gives you a sense of how remarkable that increase has been. But during the crisis, whether it is a question of lack of supply when other countries needed it, or the fact that that supply came with costs hidden or open, um, has raised very important questions on matter of supply chains. 
has been called in places more than one around the, goal, around the world about increasing the resilience of national economies or increasing their anti-fragility, as uh, others have sort of uh, pointed out. In Japan, we've seen the government um, sort of declaring incentives for com companies uh, sort of coming out of China and sort of redistributing in other parts, and in particular, receiving incentives to go back to Japan. Um, similar calls have been happening across Europe, the United States, and we've seen very recently with the new uh, contract between Apple and the Indian government uh, that Apple, Apple will progressively uh, shift to some of its production in India precisely to reduce um, the heavy dependency that the world global connectivity today has on China in itself. Um, as a result of this, two questions, which I think are very relevant to the long-term trajectory of regional security, uh, come up. One is, what is going to be the impact of a potential redistribution of uh, supply chains uh, the world over in terms of um, the uh, sort of reduction in global trade? And as a result of that, um, a shift to a world that will be um, less interdependent, still integrated, and certainly less globalized from a shipping perspective. What pressures will that bring about on uh, um, um, uh, 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 shipping companies and, and, and overall trade, raising in particular security terms the question of whether it would extend in the future if actually this redistribution of supply chains takes place, to what extent that will affect the way we think about the protection and the security of sea lanes, which today are untouchable because the integration of world economy makes it just not cost effective for anyone to disrupt such sea lanes of communication. What that question will look like uh, once there is less uh, sort of um, interdependence in terms of global shipping. And that's a very important question. Will the world, therefore, as a result of this, particularly in a context where connectivity, uh, as implicit in the concept of the Indo-Pacific, speaks to inclusiveness, will lead to a world that is less inclusive or in which national sort of priorities will de facto create a less inclusive world. And um, some indications that that might be the case have certainly occurred in a regional context over the last two months. If the COVID-19 has been a tragedy that has afflicted uh, human beings and, 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 and populations uh, the world over, on the other hand, it has represented somewhat of an opportunity for those, um, particularly in the case of, of China and um, uh, in the wider Indo-Pacific region, to take action to impose their national claims, uh, whether in terms of projection of power or uh, territorial and maritime uh, uh, sovereignty claims um, in a much uh, more assertive fashion. Here, two examples I think are very important. Um, we've seen, generally speaking, notwithstanding the COVID crisis, an increase in military activities and maritime activities in particular, or maritime related activities. Um, certainly, uh, the sinking of the Vietnamese uh, ships um, inside uh, the uh, EEZ of Vietnam, we've seen survey vessels uh, also uh, creating the problems within the same sort of uh, space. Um, uh, the uh, creation of new administrative um, in, in sort of uh, initiatives in Xixian, Changsha um, um, uh, Islands uh, in the South China Sea. And we've seen also um, increased activity in the East China Sea inside the territorial waters of the Senkaku Islands, known in China as Diao Yu. Um, we've seen a lot of activity that would speak to a greater attempt at asserting uh, national ambitions. And certainly in a broader sense, we've seen also an increase in military action that speaks to more directly problems of material power and regional order. And in particular, in this context, it comes to mind the increased military activities around Taiwan and uh, the sort of maritime and air spaces that directly relate to cross the Straits relations, whether it is the extended the period of exercises conducted by the Liaoning uh, task group uh, um, uh, from sort of like East China Sea uh, down to the South China Sea, uh, whether it is the um, two months long exercises started today um, in China 
um, uh, in the northeastern region of China. Um, we're talking about things that, in, or the night exercise, the mid-march um, air exercise in southwestern parts of the airspace close to Taiwan, we're certainly seeing a sort of a degree of increase in military activities. It speaks perhaps to uh, the fact that Taiwan, in the context of the global pandemic crisis, has been a very positive actor. It has shown how to deal with the problem. It has shown a certain degree of collegiality with the rest of the world when it sort of engaged the WHO about it. And, and certainly that did not please uh, sort of the Chinese leadership. So when we're talking about the second point that I had in mind, the one about the inclusivity, and in particular the question of order as a matter of legitimacy and power, COVID-19, it's suggesting that power, in particular material power, in order to advance claims of um, uh, regional leadership or outstanding long-term issues, it's unlikely to go out of fashion. And at the same time, legitimacy does not come as an automatic sort of result of um, a certain situation. And um, in particular, <clears throat> the uh, reactions across the region, and it is particularly significant that in Southeast Asia, uh, there is a sense of displease uh, with China's behavior over the last month and a half, particularly because it took place during COVID. In a way, uh, undermining China's attempts to create a narrative of savior of the world, of um, a country showing leadership in a context where the United States had failed to do so. So the conclusions, or at least the three points at the region level that I, that I think it's worth keeping in mind, um, are what it comes out of all of this, particularly for sort of the broader in the Pacific. Um, on the first point, the question of leadership and how order is changing, I don't think that it is fair to suggest, as it has been the case lately, that lack of US global leadership automatically translates into an opportunity for China. Um, I think um, the uh, reality in the Indo-Pacific, particularly the mismatch between narrative and behavior, suggests that um, uh, 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 the lack of leadership does not create automatic opportunities. Um, and in fact, this is a much more complicated question. One perhaps that has highlighted that whereas the leadership problem in the United States is perhaps personal, around the, the personality of, of President Trump, in China, the problem of leadership is more institutional. It's not about Xi Jinping being uh, someone that we cannot entirely trust, but the way the dynamics of COVID and how it was COVID up at the beginning uh, came about suggests that there's much more deeply ingrained institutional problem there. The second point is that in a context whereby a um, problem of order and sort of like, if you want, stability um, in terms of leadership are uh, unclear, the role that actors other than major powers will have is likely to increase. After all, if we're moving towards a question where everybody is going to be looking at supply chains, is looking at um, sort of how to retain and regain a degree of stability in a world that remains integrated, it will fall upon other actors from South Korea to Japan to Taiwan to um, uh, uh, Southeast Asian actors and European actors all to come together in this respect and step up to the plate to take up this part of the slack that is left, um, if you want, unaddressed by the um, major uh, players. Lastly, the last point really is about military power. COVID-19 has brought under uh, uh, the spotlight the importance of pandemic, natural disasters, man-made disasters, transnational security challenges as we look forward. But insofar as the Indo-Pacific is concerned, it has also highlighted that military power is not going to go out of fashion anytime soon. As a matter of fact, it is likely to remain very important. And the question really is going to be for those countries, particularly uh, affected in, term, in economic terms by the current pandemic, how to balance increased requirement to address transnational challenges such as pandemics in a context whereby the requirements for a, a world that is less inclusive and perhaps less sort of uh, uh, integrate, uh, interconnected, still integrated, but less sort of interdependent, uh, will continue to emerge and rise. Within this context, certainly reconsidering uh, the defense of sea lanes and how to address maritime disputes uh, is unlikely to go away in the region. And as a result of that, um, deterrence, both conventional and to an extent uh, 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 strategic, will remain very much um, a central issue to engage with in months and, and years ahead. On this happy note, um, I'll leave it up, uh, I'll stop it here.
my 10 minutes are gone. Uh, Murano Sensei, please, and uh, uh, the floor is yours. All right. <clears throat> Uh, at first, thank you very much for inviting me to this the, uh, web uh, public event. Uh, I'm uh, Masashi Murano, uh, uh, Japan Chair Fellow of the Hudson Institute. Uh, basically, I'm dealing with the, the hard security issues like uh, deterrence, the nuclear strategy, and the ballistic missile defense usually. But today, I'd like to address the, a little bit more broader perspective uh, related on the coronavirus situation and the security issues. Uh, facing Japan uh, from three contexts, but which related uh, each other. Uh, first, uh, responding to coronavirus is a public health issue itself. Uh, historically, in the post Cold World War uh, security studies, uh, there was a glowing argument that not only traditional security issues, such as the deterrence of armed conflict, but also issue of transnational or transregional security agenda, such as uh, energy security, uh, human security, as well as how to deal with pandemics. The ideas that should be discussed as a security issues is a broader sense. Uh, in this realm, so someone so-called uh, securitization debate. Expanding the definition of the security has the advantages and disadvantages. But at least in, in the short term, uh, we need to see the public health as a part of security issues. The, actually, some governments are doing so uh, by declaring the national uh, emergencies and so on. The, however, the, uh, from the long-term perspective, the coronavirus problem should not be viewed as a single public health problem, uh, but uh, as one of that affect all affairs. The coronavirus has a huge impact of all of the things, including politics, economies, and daily based operation of military forces, that is which Alessio mentioned. Uh, therefore, the rather than the considering coronaviruses uh, as a standalone problem, uh, they should be considered as an the embedded problem in the consideration of all security issues. Now, the some number of political leaders uh, sometimes use uh, as using the analogy of armed conflict to discuss uh, the coronavirus issues. Uh, for example, the, in one interview, the Prime Minister Abe described the coronavirus problem as the recognizing it as a World War III in terms of the crisis the world in the facing the, the same time. The, uh, in addition, the President Trump uh, a few days ago expressed that this damage from the coronavirus uh, is worse than the Pearl Harbor. Uh, this is worse than, the, this damage worse than the uh, World, Trade, World Trade Center, which means that uh, uh, 1911 situation. Uh, the context of the President Trump's remarks is so what the unclear, uh, but in any case, I, just, I do not think it is appropriate to express about the coronavirus issue with the analogy of the largest, largest scale armed um, conflict. The, in security studies, when we analyzing the threats, the, we think of the mix of intent and the capabilities. The, and although the weak coronavirus, the coronavirus has the capability to kill or injure peoples, but it is impossible to know that their intent. Mm -hmm. So it will not deter the virus that is unable to communicate. So that is a point with the, how to distinguish of the armed conflict or the fight with the coronavirus. So in, if we dare to discuss to the coronavirus in a war analogy, uh, I think that to the fight against the coronavirus is the closer to the war on terror than the armed conflict with the major powers. Uh, for instance, that in the post 9-11 security debate, the, what was discussed was that we cannot deter the terrorists uh, who are not afraid of death. So we can do the only things that it is a limiting damage in the society. 
So in other words, the strategy that countries will pursue that from now on uh, will, will be similar to coexisting with the extremism at the, uh, the acceptable, under the accept, acceptable risk. Mm. Or in other words, uh, it's the, the, about the findings, the virus in the, the community and the, uh, classing it, the virus will not be zelled out, but if the number of the infected people uh, can be kept within the medical capacity and the infected cluster groups that can be kept track, up, track of that the damage can be limited. The, or the, if a some vaccine is developed, the, it will be help this, this operation. And the, however, how to detect infected person across the groups uh, can be uh, problematic. So what I mean by this is the China or even South Korea track personal activities records from the smartphones or GPS records the, and other devices mm -hmm. the, in a, a fairly uh, meticulous manner, so which has led to some, some success in the contained virus. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the similar to the debate of the, over the Patriot Act in the U.S., mm -hmm. the, which expanded the scope of the intelligence gathering after the 9-11. So in other words, the, the argument is that individual uh, uh, freedom and the rights of the, the individual rights that should be somewhat restricted if it is the, the in interest of the public safety or public security. Uh, however, this also means a temporary giving up the political system that the liberal democracies they have pride of the themselves on and the uh, use of the advantages and embracing that in totalitarian or uh, authoritarian aspect. So which means that this is the political ideological uh, contradiction. So I think that this point also affected to the second uh, point, which I started to talk about this point. The second the, uh, context or second point is, is of these issues that is related on the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the strate strategic competition or long-term competition between US and China. From the current US China relationship or US China rivalry as a Cold War. That because of the definition and the context of the concept of the Cold War, uh, uh, very sensitive and they pointed out the similarity and the differences. The, however, in the period, period of recovery from this situation, the competition between the US and China over political, uh, economic, uh, even military and uh, medical or some other advanced technologies, as well as the sphere of influence that they provided to other countries, uh, will become that more intense. So, so what is the particu particularly difficult is the sometimes the totalitarian uh, or uh, authoritarian systems. Mm -hmm. that constraints of the freedom of the peoples that, such as China may be better suited for the contain of the control of the that, uh, coronavirus pandemics. So it is not a wonder to that some countries find these methods out, out attractive. So the question of the US, United States or its allies is how to recover from this pandemic the crisis the while maintaining the freedom and the economic prosperity. Mm -hmm. uh, United States and its allies, including Japan, they also deferred the, in their responsive to, uh, response to coronavirus. The for, for example, the United States, uh, where I, when I uh, live in now, uh, do not track infected cluster group using the, the detail of the personal information. The, but uh, it does not have the lockdown mm -hmm. as a considerably limited of the freedom. Uh, however, in case of Japan, which has relatively a few fatalities and uh, 
that does not uh, have the strict as a lockdown as a Europe and the United States and try to limit it, uh, the damage uh, to the socioeconomy uh, through the rules of the self deregulation. So even if the United States and its allies recover from this situation, the, it does not mean that the liberal or democratic groups that has shown in the regime advantages, it is the, the dealt with the it differences because of the, our the, uh, uh, countermeasures against violence is slightly different. So that is a, a little bit the complexity to to uh, share of the, our the, uh, the narratives to recovering from these uh, shocks. So how quickly we recover from this uh, coronavirus shock and rebuild our economy and security will remarks that we make that competition between the US models and the Chinese models even more the pronounced. So this is the, the unmistakable uh, inter-regime competition and it's there has to be said that it is a cold war. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, so the that is my a short conclusion that the complexity of the context at the current international situation is the, the dual structure of the dealing with the coronavirus uh, while fighting with a strategic competition between US and China that lies behind it. So that is one of the major problems. The dual structure is the one of the major complexity of this situation. Uh, at last, that uh, at, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about the more operational perspective. This is a third context that it's already uh, you, uh, a little bit mentioned about. As I noted earlier, the U.S. advantages is in the competing with China has been its network of allies and partners. So, in other words, the strength of the United States and allies was that they are uh, connected. The, to both the kinetic physically or non-physically. Uh, however, it has been dif uh, difficult to continue the physical connection. The, for example, the United States has canceled or postponed a number of joint exercises with Japan, mm -hmm. South Korea, and others. So there are uh, also a number of infections within the uh, US aircraft carrier cell the laws built that uh, lead ended to the, in the it's temporary inactive. In addition, uh, it's also already the Arashio mentions that from May 8th, the Chinese Coast Guard vessels, they have invaded, uh, intruded to the ter uh, territorial waters around Japan's Senkaku Islands in uh, attempt to enforce the law, a Chinese law, uh, by the tracking Japanese fishing boats. Uh, these actions and, and behaviors have been taking place in the South China Sea, uh, but it was unusual for, for them to take place in the East China Sea. So the, while dealing with the coronavirus, the Japan's Coast Guard, the Japan's self-defense forces, and the U.S. forces needed to maintain their readiness, readiness uh, so as not uh, to overreact Chinese the opportunistic creeping expansion to challenge the status quo. Oh, that is my current the perspective or the to the see the uh, current uh, the security situation and the coronavirus. Uh, I, I stop here. Thank you very much, Murana san I think the basic the, all the points that you were making, um, how do we sort of what kind of framework we cast over uh, our understanding of COVID as a security issue? Um, how sort of that relates to the long-term ongoing competition between mm -hmm. China and the United States also will um, affect us. And again, the last point, um, I hear you loud, loud and clear, the question of capabilities, not just in terms of material, but also the ability of alliances, which are key to the United States uh, as an actor in the Asia Pacific and the broader in the Pacific, uh, will mm -hmm. continue to operate, are uh, sort of the sort of issues that we will uh, have to think more about and will remain uh, with us more. Um, Takako, would you like to jump in and now sort of bring everything together? Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Alessio, for this opportunity. Um, a webinar is a new thing that came out. One of the silver linings of all this is that we've discovered new ways to connect and to exchange 
um, intellectually across borders. And so I think this is one of our new things that we'd be doing at Columbia too. And I'm really happy to take part in yours today. Um, so the question posed to me um, from Alessio was ex to examine the political context in Japan and how the current situation affects the Abe administration, its plans, and Abe's own quest for legacy. In particular, how and if COVID-19 has shifted the balance in Japanese politics and what possible repercussions on security and foreign policy. And that's a really tall order, and I'm not going to be able to cover everything. But my short answer is that maybe it's useful to think in terms of the policy and the process and the politics sort of separately to sort of evaluate what we've been seeing so far and to see what implication that may have for security and foreign policy. Um, but what I will not do is to talk about what exactly Japanese government response was, but to instead point you to an excellent article written by my friend Kazuto Suzuki in The Diplomat on call about the Japan model, uh, which describes what the Japanese government has been doing. As uh, Masashi said, I think Japan's government approach is slightly different from other countries that is making people wonder uh, what's going on. And this, I think, is article as well as his press conference. One of the things that we discovered is that we can see other countries' press conferences to the foreign press club is actually very useful. So if you want to hear that, I'm not going to take that, but go um, check out what Kazuto Suzuki has to say. Another thing I wouldn't do is evaluate what Japanese government policy is to um, other countries' response. For this, I'd like to point to Philip Lipsy's excellent piece in the foreign policy. A magazine about the difficulty of picking winners and losers to the response of government because of the different socioeconomic conditions and whatnot. So that I like to just point to my friends and not do it myself, but instead talk about how I view what's going on in Japan um, as an outside observer. I'm actually in New York City, um, in the epicenter of all things, um, not to take pride in it, but it's just that I've been more of an outside observer, kind of puzzled by what's going on in Japan rather than being part of um, the Japanese public, my family's there, so I do um, talk to them a lot, but I'm sort of looking at it more like an outsider. Um, so I guess the question is, what has COVID-19 revealed about Japanese politics, uh, whether it has changed, and what are the unexpected, and how it's relevant to what we're talking about today, security and foreign policy, especially with regards to what Masashi said right now about Japan's role in the region and what it can do as an ally. And finally, I'd like to add one word on the self-defense force because I used to teach at the National Defense Academy in my area of research is civil military relations, how they fit in. So what has COVID-19 um, revealed about the Japanese politics? Um, I think what the interesting thing to start with is the point that Japan's um, death per capita is comparatively low. It's very low. Um, but despite the fact that in terms, in that big uh, from that point of view, Japan has done fairly well. Uh, the public has not attributed the low death to the actions of government. <laughs> that is to say, there was an article um, in The Economist on May 9th about um, looking at different countries' uh, approval rating and whether there was a rally around the flag effect in other countries. Abe's ranking was, I think, the lowest at 28%, and Trump is 44. And from somebody being in the US, being lower than Trump is quite something. Um, and that, uh, for me, it's rather shocking. So why is there a discrepancy between what we see, like an international sort of report card, and how Japan's been doing in terms of low death per capita? And one way to say is that maybe it's different if you look at domestic polls, and that's not really true either. If I, I've been looking at the NHK, which is like BBC, the Mexic polls, and the most recent that I've seen is one of April 14th, but approval rating of the cabinet has been going down on 44 to 39%. Disapproval, it has been around 38. So it's like, like half and half. Um, and, um, and also, why do they approve? The answer is not that encouraging in the sense that it's because they're better than other options. And part of it is they support the LDP. And why I disapprove is that um, either the Abbey government is not trustworthy or there's no hope in policy, which they say is 28%. Um, and at the same time, the public seems to be very worried about infection. So it's not that they don't care about this issue. 89% who respond and say they are very worried about receptor infection. Um, but the evaluation of um, government policy is not that high. Why? 
So I think one answer is in the process that um, it's hard to sort of think about how things have evolved because I think all of us went through this whole storm in a way. It's hard to remember where it started. But I think for like us in the US, it kind of started in early March. Mm. And that's where our like reference point is. In Japan, the first infection was found January 16th. So Japan has been going through this for a very, very long time. Um, that, um, and that they chartered uh, evacuation flights to Wuhan on, at the end of January. The Diamond Princess incident, if anybody remembers the Diamond Princess incident, is on February, like the self-defense force operation started February 6th. And schools were closed on February 27th. And at that point for us in the US, we we're wondering why is that an overreaction in the U.S.? So anyway, my point is that the Special Measures Act was um, done in um, March 13th, and the state of emergency finally came at, on April 7th after there was a decision made to postpone the Olympics on March 24th. But Japan has been going through this for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So in a way, there's a lot of fatigue about dealing with this, of, of course, among the public. And I'm sure um, because... Uh, uh, on the government side. So where we are right now is that there was a state of emergency declared. And uh, now um, they extended the state of emergency on May 4th, but I think today or yesterday, as of Jap uh, Japan time, they lifted the state of emergency in 39 out of 47 prefectures. So they're kind of going back, going into the restart, which is sort of in parallel to what's happening um, in New York right now. But overall, um, so is it just because it was too long and that's the only reason why that they are not that popular. I don't think that's true. And I think there's some indecisiveness that uh, may worry those who are looking at Japan's response to these kind of crises. I do think that what's interesting in terms of um, the process um, is that despite the fact, if you, Alessia, you mentioned leadership, um, it's easy to talk about Abe leadership and sort of talk about the person. But I think what's also important is that in the past 20 years, we saw a more concentration of power in the prime minister, that the prime minister does have more staff around him. There's a national security secretariat. It's, it's supposedly more centralized and effective in the crisis. And that's not exactly how we saw it. Maybe it's because of a different type of issue being a pandemic. There's other ministries as well, but it's not exactly what we thought, what we have in the system that we're going to see in Japan. And that I think is somewhat surprising and maybe disappointing and might, may cause some worries. But I do think that a lot of this has to do with um, the timing and the, and, the, and the nature of the policy being relatively new and they're trying to sort of muddle through. Uh, the other thing is that since the process is so prolonged and they got to see other countries doing what they do, there was more of a balancing between what are the economic costs versus the public health worries in a way that it wasn't the case probably in London, probably in New York, where the pandemic just hit so strongly that we didn't really have that discussion for a long time. We just had to deal to people, save people's lives. And I think the sense of urgency might have been lacking in Japan for that reason. Um, so how about policy? So um, I think in terms of the lack of testing, which is often cited in Japan to be different, and I think I go back to this later, which I think might be sort of a liability for Japan going forward, having taken this approach in terms of international accountability when they start reopening to the other, uh, other countries, this might be a different approach might hurt them. But I think, you know, that and also more uh, um, economic measures. Um, I looked at the polls and it's also re relatively split. And also people are not that grateful for the government to send them masks. Like the Japanese public received two masks per family. And according to my family, they haven't received it yet. And that's like, if there's one, it's one thing to distribute masks, it's another to not be able to have it there yet, but it doesn't seem to be that um, popular. So, so my point is that maybe they were saved by the politics of it, which is that it's not that there's a credible alternative. The LDP support has been going down now. It's uh, 33 percent, but it's not like the biggest opposition parties support approval rating is four percent and that or like among the Japanese public what it, what party do you select and the first the top is LDP by, by 33 percent the second up is Constitution Democratic Party at four percent and what's increasing is number of those who are not affiliated with any party or do not have some support some specific party support which is 45 percent so to going forward, we have to see where the non, no particular party affiliation people go in terms of policy, because they are the largest voting bloc. 
And that has been the case for a long time, but it's actually more clear for that. So the balance has shifted because there's no balance to where it shifts. That currently, I think there is no alternative why well or to the LDP. I think what is questioned now is whether um, Prime Minister Abe would be able to extend once again by changing the internal party rules to uh, for a fourth term. Currently, his third term expires September 2020, 2021. Um, and um, I don't think many think it's likely that he would extend beyond. But one thing to note that he doesn't, like as long as like, he doesn't call for election voluntarily and lose, he does have a longer term than President Trump. So like, I, I get to that point, but we, he, he's looking for a longer term. Um, the other big question is the Olympics, uh, whether or not we can have the Olympics at all next year. And that I think might have a lot to do with legacy. You asked about the legacy. I'm not too sure uh, if it is as strongly as in constitutional reform as other people might say. I think the Japanese public is less excited about it right now. So I don't really know if that's what he wants to say, what his legacy is meant to be, but the Olympics is the bigger question. Um, and the other final possibility to just to point out is that one thing that was interesting looking at the whole process in Japan is the rise of local leaders. Japan is not a federal system, but there were some governors and mayors who sort of went against the government, the central government directives, or against or did something different, like the policy response was different, whether they will capture the momentum. We don't see that as a national effort, but that I thought was very interesting looking at what's happening in Japan. So what's the relevance to security and foreign policy? As I said, in terms of the process, we thought there's more to the centralization of power to the prime minister. We didn't exactly see that this time. And is that just because of this? Or do we have to kind of look at how Japan operates in a crisis one more and review that um, in a way that we kind of assume that things are going to be more smooth? Or is it really just to the pandemic? I don't know. But I think the bigger question is what happens more worldwide, the bigger questions that um, uh, Masashi said with regards to two things. One, is a heightened tension between US and China um, and how that's gonna affect Japan's going forward. Um, just to reflect on what was happening prior to, um, Japan was planning to have Xi Jinping visit um, China, uh, Japan and, and some right-wing people were critical of um, Prime Minister Abe being reluctant to impose more stronger measures vis-a-vis -vis China because of the anticipation of Xi coming to Japan when the cherry blossoms bloom. And that did not happen obviously, but like, but in a way, I think Japan may have to show its flag of in terms of who they support, whether if the relation between US and China is more contentious. Um, I think that they might be in a more difficult position of not trying to play it both ways. And I don't really, I'm not really in the camp who think it's a good thing for the US to be confrontational with the China. With China, I don't think that's necessarily a good thing for Japan at all. But I think it's just that it might be hard to do both ways. The other is changes in US policy. Some of it is Trump factor and some of it's not. I think that even if we have a change of precedent in November, um, US is not going to be that willing to spend more on defense. US is not willing to have um, allies free ride in a way that Trump might describe it. There will be probably less emphasis on having allies pay for something as in the Trump administration, which if he continues, I think there might be a lot of discussion about how much Japan is supposed to pay for the US forces in Japan, but still even with the Biden administration in place, the allies might be asked to do more and how exactly that's going to factor into Japan's internal discussion I think is important. Um, just one note about self-defense force. Um, their role in, in the pandemic response was actually very uh, notable. And I'm saying this not because we are having, if I can plug something as LSEO or um, Defense Minister Kono is going to do a webinar with us at Columbia next week on Thursday 21st. Um, in London, it will be 1 p.m. I think, but it's going to be on Facebook Live, so please log in to Weatherhead East Asian Institute, Columbia.edu. But, so you can ask questions to Defense Minister Kono, but I think what was interesting about the South Defense Force is they were the first line of defense for the Diamond Princess outbreak. They actually went to pick up people in Wuhan. And the doctors that are uh, South Defense Force doctors were actually in the front lines in the effect. And also they help out at the airport in terms of care time. But what I think is most interesting is that although a lot of expectation, there's a lot of expectation from the public for the role of the South Defense Force ever since the earthquake hit M311. But I think it was good that the Defense Minister was able to not just let the mission drag, that they actually handed it over to the private sector. But it does raise a question going forward. To what extent is Japan, the South Defense Force is gonna balance the expectation that they play these kind of relatively non-traditional roles? Of course, this time around, the US military did play a role in the pandemic response, but there is a wider range of things that Japanese South Defense Forces tend to do 
in these kind of crises than um, in the US, but partly for public relations purposes, because that's what the Japanese public expect. But also the emissions tend to creep in a way in these kind of crises. How to go about doing meeting that expectations as they go forward is important. I think there's two things to consider. One is the possibility of ex expanding the reserve component and what they have right now, especially on special permission professions and to having like a FEMA type of organization. So that's two things. So finally, to go back to um, what you mentioned about the connectivity inclusiveness and what Masashi said about um, going forward, I'm trying to bring back the leadership question. I think, you know, right now, Japan is sort of off cycle in many ways with other countries because of the different cycle of the pandemic. Also, they're off in some ways because they've dealt with the crisis in a different way. And I don't really hear about Japan in New York. You hear about China, you hear about South Korea, but Japan is kind of absent in the discussion here because it's so different in terms of what they do. But I do think that if, if, but Japan does benefit a lot from the connectivity of the region. They cannot live without the allies. So going forward, I think the question for Japan is how to step up to fill the void or fill the vacuum and what exactly it should do for the region militarily, but also in terms of what they can do at the level of international institutions. And finally, Japan um, has been trying to look at security issues comprehensively. The bottom line is hard security. That's what is immediate concern is. And I think that's very important. At the same time, they've always looked at issues like human security or comprehensive security. And I think in terms of looking at what institutions can play, what role Japan can play, it might be kind of useful to sort of go back to that too. And try, if Japan is going to feel relatively better than other countries in terms of death toll, and if we do still believe that Japan is quite good high technology, there might be things Japan can do for one thing. If Japan can step up and try to curb the effort of other countries to try to, con to keep the, the vaccines and whatnot, if there is a cure to themselves, how to counter the nationalistic tendencies of other countries to be less transparent and very um, inclusive, that's good. Um, and also other things in terms of um, trying to bring together countries while US is gonna be preoccupied with own, its own damage with the presidential election, if there's something Japan can do, even with the UN General Assembly meeting not happening in New York, like not happening the way it does in September, if, the, if there's a way Japan can step up, I think that's something that we would like to see and we don't currently see right now. So sorry, I went too long, but hopefully I can respond to your questions and so forth. Thanks. You're muted. Yes, I, I, I <laughs> muted myself. Um, thank you very much, Takago. I mean, this was exactly that, the sort of comprehensive uh, bringing things together that I was really looking for, uh, forward to hearing from you. So thank you very much for this. Uh, we already have quite a few questions. So what I'll do, I will sort of collect them um, and direct the fire um, as it were. Um, I'll start with a couple of questions that came uh, in for Murano-san. Um, the first one uh, was about the war narrative chosen by um, Abe and to what extent you think um, has been appealing to Japanese society given also the sort of the sensitivity that that brings about um, or whether that was just a, a passing reference and has not really sort of uh, taken up with um, uh, within the broader sort of uh, public uh, um, uh, space. Um, the other question raised to Muran-san goes directly to the point you were making about the operational implication of COVID. Um, with the operational context of network of allies and partners in the region, uh, how do you bring South Korea in jointly building the readiness uh, to face China's creeping expansion within uh, Japan's context. So to what extent COVID uh, might push the United States to have allies like Japan and South Korea to work more closely together, knowing that the last couple of years haven't been very generous <laughs> in terms of Japan-South Korea uh, relations. So a couple of questions uh, to begin with. Um, um, and then I'll come back to uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to Kako for a couple of other questions. Uh, all right, thank you so much to the SM uh, uh, two questions. Uh, I'd like to address the from the uh, later question, second questions uh, related to the some um, how do we react, how do we respond to the, the Japan, the South Korea relationships. I think that uh, it is not, it may, may not be the uh, different uh, direct answer the, through the, the the coronavirus crisis that two countries that are looking for the opportunity to improve uh, to to improve the relationship and strengthening our corporations the 
the for instance that the, the other day is that the five years old uh, South Korean girls who had the suddenly fall acute uh, rookie, rookiemia in India mm -hmm. uh, was transported to Seoul uh, on the uh, Japanese flight. That it is because that uh, India to uh, Korean flight uh, is already cancelled. That so it's not uh, so as a, one of the, the alternative options. The, uh, this was the result of the, the cooperation of the Japanese embassies in India and the allocates the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So it is not a direct contribution of the, to, uh, to how do we deal with the Chinese creeping expansion in the, this mm -hmm. region. But uh, it is those kind of the fundamental the diplomatic or the uh, some uh, the improvised co collaboration with Japan and South Korea is one of the important things to uh, improve our the uh, relationship uh, with the uh, deteriorated during these the year, these uh, uh, recent a couple of years. So that is the one of the typical one of good example to improve our relationship. It is not a that, that elected even it's not directed on uh, directed related on the the security affairs. The another things another question the first question is the the, uh, the why the Prime Minister Abe to express as as a uh, World War Three and the current the coronavirus situation. Uh, personally, from my perspective, uh, I don't think that it is not much to uh, to do with Article Nine of the Constitution and uh, Prime Minister Abe is linking to the coronavirus situation and war. Uh, rather, this crisis is not related on the Article 9 issues, but the Japan has the, the can, not has, but the, it may be, pos may be able to the, the more bigger roles in the international, international society to deal with the, this uh, situation. To the more the broader perspective, not only the JSD, JSDF operation. So, I think that uh, of course that I'm I'm a not expert of this realms, but, but uh, the Japanese government should uh, have the think about the more uh, broader perspective. How do we Japan uh, contribute both for the uh, this situation? That one of the one of the related issues is the the Japan's current. Uh, the first of all, Japan has the uh, two or three the important the strategic document uh, is the design. Uh, one is the national security strategy is the the established on the 2013. That is one of the latest, latest version of the national security strategy. On the other hand, the some national defense program guideline, it's so called an NDPG is the uh, purely focused on the defense strategy. The, it is a, the comparison of the US, the national defense strategy. But there's sometimes those kind of strategic documents that are sometimes overlapped each other. So the next time the current national defense program guideline is review, has reviewed on the end of the 2018, but at the same time, national security strategy has not reviewed at the same time. But mm -hmm. the, in, during the, maybe that the, the two years later or three years later, the, the Japanese government may, I think that Japanese government needed to review of the national security strategies. In this context, the 2013 version of national security strategy has just mentioned about the pan uh, dealing with the pandemics just one time in the whole document but uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, it is the one of the opportunity to to distinguish to the role of the strategic document of the national security strategy it has the focus on the more broader co uh, context of the global affairs and the uh, security strategy not a, a focus on the defense strategy so that is a one of the opportunity to uh, uh, reviewing of the national security uh, strategy document in the next time to deal how to deal with the, the pandemic or uh, a more broader perspective connect, connect context of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, let me stop here.
Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I'm conscious of the time and what I'll do, I'll try to sort of keep it short, but perhaps we could extend for another five minutes um, our conversation and, and, and try to sort of um, bring in all the questions that are left. There's quite a few of them, but um, if we try to keep the answers relatively short, let me try to group them together. Um, I think there's a couple of ones that, that really sort of speak to some of the points that Takako was making. Uh, we have a question here from James um, um, uh, about um, the Abe government decision to include uh, relocation funding for Japanese firms to leave China as part of the COVID stimulus package. Uh, to what extent um, you think that also perhaps relates to the point you were making about the fact that Xi Jinping, before Xi Jinping was supposed to come to, to Japan, the Japanese were standing, the Japanese government was, was, was holding their cards very close to their chest in a way, um, without um, uh, 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 trying to look too much confrontational. But now that that is off the table for the time being, and given also what is happening with the supply chain, and particularly with this question of the uh, 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 relocation funding for Japanese firms to move out of China, and um, any thought about this? So that's point number one. Uh, related to the other point you mentioned on the SDF, I've got quite a few questions uh, coming up. Um, I will try to summarize it. Um, broadly speaking, Simon is asking, um, are we looking at a context where the armed forces in general, and certainly the self-defense forces, will be asked to diversify more the spectrum of missions they are supposed uh, to, to undertake and going beyond war fighting. Um, and within this context, um, Aidan asks, uh, do you have any sort of, um, 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 are you, uh, do you have any sort of awareness that um, uh, financial resources being allocated to military laboratories for RRD in terms of the development of uh, vaccine? Um, and uh, Monica is asking, uh, how do you think the self-defense forces can do better in non-traditional crises like COVID-19? Is there a resource, an asset? And it kind of ties in with the point that uh, uh, um, Murano-san has just made um, in terms of, uh, in the national documents in Japan, there is a, at the moment a bit of a separation between traditional, um, if you want, understanding of security and the broadening. Are we looking at the broadening? I mean, I think the broader sort of like, a, uh, underpinning question linking all these uh, uh, excellent questions together really is to what extent are we looking at the self-defense forces as changing in terms of what they can provide as an asset as a tool of statecraft for Japanese foreign policy particularly in pandemics we'll be looking at a widening of experience um, in that sense and more specifically it, on the matter of the relocation any thoughts about the Abe government sort of uh, a decision to allocate funding to move out of China Uh -oh, hang on. Somehow you were muted. Okay. I will try to be short. Thanks for the great, excellent questions. The first point um, about um, China and the initiative by the government to um, encourage firms to supply domestically or to come back or opt out of China. Um, I think the, there's an immediate concern and a long term strategy, but I don't really know exactly how this is going to pan out. And one thing to might be no interest you know that there is going to be a subset or a component that looks like economic issues within the national security setup and establishment. Mm -hmm. I haven't really seen the organized social chart, but there's going to be people who are going to be from economic ministries looking at the strategic issues within the cabinet secretary. So that might drive policies to a certain direction, but it's just that it's not really clear which way it'll go. But I think right now, I think what we see is more in line with what we see in the U.S. in terms of being a little more cautious about being dependent on China and that there might be more thinking or economic parts of thinking in the strategy going forward. I'm actually curious to know what um, Masashi thinks about that, but we don't have time, so I'm just going to move on to the next question. Um, as for the um, diversification, um, just to uh, briefly note that um, as is the case in many other militaries, the self-defense force has a medical component. Hmm. And they have a defense medical college, and there's the, um, doctors and nurses within the self-defense force, and they were in the front lines of Diamond Prince's uh, outbreak. And the knowledge from what the very pretty detailed analysis of what happened on the Diamond Princess actually helped a lot of countries in dealing with each crisis. So that uh, is something that defense minister is very um, conscious of, and they do, I think, in terms of spending, they might try to... Um, 
um, spend a little bit more on what they already have in terms of the medical component of the um, self-defense force. So there might be more international awareness, uh, awareness that this might be something Japan can contribute internationally more so than it did prior to the crisis. Having said that, it comes down to a matter of money mm. and prioritization. Because I do not think that for domestic economic reasons that the Japanese defense budget is gonna be like growing rapidly after COVID-19. I think there's gonna be more pressure downwards or not, it's not gonna like expand. So given what we are spending right now and what kind of demands there's gonna be in the regional maritime front, how are you gonna justify spending more? Like what are gonna be the ways in which we shift around resources? Like, uh, because in the end, a lot of the efforts that took place aside from the professional doctor nurse part is the ground self-defense forces. In a way, they are benefiting in a way from the fact that they can be very useful in these kind of non-traditional crises. But I think if you're a Navy person, you would think like, why do we spend so much on ground self-defense forces? if it's just gonna be for non-traditional missions. Don't we need to spend more on maritime stuff uh, if we really forget get the hard security issues or the issues in the region going forward? So I think it's gonna be hard choices. And I think one key is probably, as Amasashi said, that there should be more integration between what we try to do in the national security strategy and what we actually purchase in the national defense program guidelines and what are the choices Japan's gonna be making, probably within the context of not hugely ex like raising uh, or expanding the defense budget, what are gonna be our prioritization? And that right now, I think the current way things are being spent, I don't think is the most effective or efficient going forward for the Japanese defense establishment for its better use both domestically and internationally. Wonderful, I, I think we're running out of time. So I'll be very quickly asking um, uh, Murana-san, if you could, uh, you, you talked about the um, um, the Coscut um, incident, um, around the same kind of islands, uh, what do you think the implication of, of, of this particular instance? As you say, you made a very good point. It is quite unusual, and it has been unusual over the last three years, since 2016, to see a situation like that occurring. Why now? What does that mean? Um, a couple of thoughts. And there was also another question about, um, uh, as the perception of Japan towards the quads and the potential of the quads in terms of regional um, security, uh, change, changing after COVID-19, or um, are we going to be looking at a Japan that um, will be continued, continuously sort of engaged through FOI um, with Quad and other sort of multilateral security initiatives across the region? Uh, a few words on, on, on both aspects would be very much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. That, that I think that the one is, uh, the situation of the, the East China Sea and the Chinese Coast Guard vessels to tracking the Japanese fishing boat, the, this the behavior is, I think that I uh, see, saw that this behavior is the one of the Chinese, the typical the, the probing uh, behavior to uh, uh, checking to the, our reaction, to how do we uh, deal with the, the, this, or, uh, this situation and uh, some uh, changes happen to this come our, the, our means that uh, uh, Japanese Coast Guard or the self -defense, maritime self-defense forces that uh, routine or, or regularly the operational the postures. So in that context that uh, we do not uh, show in the, our lack of the capabilities of the oper uh, routine operations. So that uh, in that context that uh, the Japanese Coast Guard uh, has to be regularly to, uh, to, to operate in this very area. So mm -hmm. that is one of the uh, typical measures of the, the uh, conventional or deterrence theory. So it, those kind of the, uh, probing or limited probing action is the, too difficult to deter the, uh, comparing with the, the major military aggressions. Okay, so it's kind of the Chinese style the uh, uh, hybrid warfare, or we so-called the gray zone situations, so to 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 taking the uh, making the new normal. So in that context, that uh, that we need to to, to operate the regularly you know, the coast guard and the maritime self defense forces and the air self defense forces. Uh, the I. I don't. I don't have uh, some specific perspective now that, that about the question of the uh, uh, quad uh, cooperation of these issues. So, the, of course, that that is important things to the one of, that is the how do we deal with the global pandemic is the 
maybe the, uh, maybe become or the next major agenda to deal with the, the uh, four countries. But at the same time, I've already mentioned about the, the difficulty is the, the actually our uh, countermeasures of this uh, situation are slightly uh, uh, different uh, in case of Japan and in case of the uh, uh, US and Australia and India. Uh, so in that rounds that uh, that is one of the challenges how do we uh, making the new uh, narratives or stories to collaborate with the, the and how, what is the our advantage how do we identify the, our advantages of the the uh, coalition of willingness to share the, the value of the, our interests. So that is my point. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid we're definitely running out of time. And um, what I'll do, I'll just take a half a minute to answer a couple of questions that had been raised uh, to me um, at the beginning. Um, one concerning the question of uh, quite similar in a way, and they're talking about the implications of uh, diversification in supply chains and uh, reduce dependency on China, um, both in terms of what does that entail in terms of relationship that individual countries have with China, but also what does that entail in terms of the business model of uh, the shipping industry and would reduce the capacity um, and certainly a different type of distribution of how shipping goes around, what does that mean uh, for connectivity and the protection of sea lanes? And, and I think both questions um, are very important. Um, and I think what was emerging from the discussion that, that we're all having, it seems to me that it's kind of like, we can certainly see that it, that is an option there, that the world will be very different in a few years' time. But if the uh, sort of consequences from an economic point of view uh, are sort of short-lived in terms of economic impact, we might actually defer that decision further down the road and wait because uh, rethinking your supply chains in a considerable fashion um, requires considerable changes to national economies. And in a situation whereby over the next 18 months, we will probably be all occupied in trying to recover from the impact of the current situation. I think it is quite interesting to see what decisions will be made over the next 18 months. Will be made just to find a solution to the lack, uh, to the economic downturn and recession that we've seen uh, happening at the moment, or will be made in a way to build a different future in which integration is still on the table, but dependency and interdependency is a very different context. If that happens, I think within 18 months, we'll have a much clearer idea of the wider implication of world connectivity, and in that sense, sort of um, regional and international stability. Certainly, a less integrated, um, um, a less interconnected world, which remains integrated, but in which we have more resilience and anti-fragility in our economy, will likely to bring about greater political willingness to challenge others who matters that matters to us in ways that we haven't seen so far. Even within the European Union, there is a great question, a set of questions coming up regarding the relationship with China. And certainly in the UK, that's been a main topic of discussion among political elites, not just within government. So there is a lot more to come, um, but we'll see uh, sort of how that will all pan out and will we take time to understand that. Thank you very much to uh, my guests today for uh, all their thoughts and their insights and sharing with, uh, with us their experience. And um, thank you all of you who've been patiently listening and for all the very good question. Um, um, again, bid you farewell and we'll see you soon next week, hopefully for our next webinar with Rory Medical for conversation to him and Sir Lawrence Friedman shortly after taking, taking place shortly before the very interesting seminar with the Minister of Defence at Columbia, which also I would suggest everybody um, to attend. Uh, thank you, uh, Murano-san. Thank you, Takaka-sensei. Um, and you all have a good evening. Thank you.